Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome um, everyone to today's uh, roundtable discussion uh, on the topic of uh, passive versus active, uh, an impartial discussion between all of these key stakeholders in the uh, pharmaceutical supply chain. Um, the session itself is uh, planned to last for 60 minutes and then we have an opportunity 30 minute session where we can have a, a live question and answer uh, at the end. So if there are any questions that any of you may have, uh, we would actively encourage you to ask them. In fact, we love questions. It's a really great way of increasing uh, our knowledge and everyone that's participating in the, uh, in the discussions today. Uh, before we get started, um, I'd like to introduce you to our very esteemed roundtable participants uh, and they are first of all Roger Chu who is the global sales director for SFS Pharma Logistics. We're joined by Brendan Beach the director of global network and business development at Multicourt Global Logistics. Mike Meekin is joining us as vice president of global quality and regulatory compliance for DHL supply chain. Mike Slippin, Director of Value Stream Management of the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. And Mikhail Grusowski, the Cargo Director of Lot Polish Airlines. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to today's session. So let's get, let's get moving on with our very first question. In relation to what affects our choice or your choice uh, when choosing between an active and a passive container. And I'd like Brendan, maybe if you could take that first question for us in relation to your choices in respect of an active and or passive container. Sure, thanks Henry and good morning everybody. Um, we as a logistics company obviously share the common goal um, with our clients in, in that we need to get the products where it needs to be, when it needs to be there, and most importantly, in the condition that it needs to arrive in. And that's really what then drives the decision of whether we use passive or active containers. So from our point of view as a logistics provider, we don't really have a preference. Uh, obviously our preference is that the correct one is chosen, uh, but I guess from the, from the client's point of view, it's, it's all around that. It's around the logistics routes that are available, um, whether or not, uh, there's a time constraint, whether the aircraft are big enough to take the particular type of container, whether the, the route allows a, a return of, of a box if it's, a, if it's an active container. And so there's lots of dialogue that needs to take place between ourselves and the, the client. Uh, sometimes that will involve the shipper, the manufacturer of the products, because generally they are the ones that give us the most information around how the product needs to, needs to be transported. Um, and and I, I guess the great thing is that um, now that there's been developments in both, um, there's a lot more choice in the sense that, you know, um, quite a while ago, you know, you, you may have only been able to choose one rather than the other. But certainly with innovation, uh, now we have, a, we have a greater depth of choice. Um, but it's all really for us around the dialogue with the client um, and the specific needs of, of the specific shipment, where it's going how long it's going to take to get there and the temperature range uh, and time constraints around the, the, the specific shipment. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Very, very true. Um, Mike Slippin, if I could, if I could ask your opinion on it, obviously being a, a shipper yourself, your thoughts in respect of uh, you know, the different types of technologies available, what influences your choice in, in regards what system you use? Yeah, I think the first choice is about from what the product is, what we are shipping. So we have about um, 80 plus pharmaceutical products, of which about 15 to 20% needs to be shipped on the cold chain. Um, those conditions differ from time. So we have many products, two to eight degrees Celsius. We also have products which we ship at minus 20 degrees Celsius. And I think the, the recent COVID vaccine from Janssen is one of those. So that choice limits often. For example, now we, we have no choice for active containers with minus 20 degrees Celsius. But for others, we do. So if we have a choice, then we're going to see from, um, as just was mentioned, what is the time that we have to reach the destination? 
um, is it uh, often it's like within 48 hours. That's normally what we are handling. Um, um, it's also the value which is in there. We mm -hmm. have products with a cost price of $1.80. We have products with a cost price of $2,000. That's really from our side also depends on, okay, what kind of solution we are looking at. So those, I think, are major items when we make the decision. Excellent. Yeah, value is an important one, I think, isn't it? And, and I think also Brendan's point about transit times and, and destinations. Um, Roger, Roger, from your perspective, what are, you, what are your thoughts in, in respect to the different types of technology? Uh, hi, Henry. Thanks very much. So for, for my side, uh, that depends on uh, what the client wants. So sometimes uh, when I speak to a customer to say, hey, I only want to use this container. We already validate the container. We run all the lane back qualification. Just use this container. So we, we are, uh, get very limited in our choices. But sometimes there are, there are clients who say, you know, guys, you carry the freight, you're responsible for it, you, you choose. Now, when that, that happens, then I need to look at the con container availability. Whether is it available in that particular country, and then most important is, of course, the total uh, landed cost. Uh, other factors I consider is uh, the amount of payload I can load into the container, and then also the airline acceptance. So these, these, are, the, these are things which I look out for before I propose to the clients. And of course, the, the, flight, the flight route and the return logistics, if it's a passive uh, container, uh, usually for active container, you can return it uh, to the airlines. But also, uh, to talk a little bit more active, just, uh, you know, from my experience, most of the uh, farmer clients that I deal with, uh, when it comes to super high value cargo, somehow it's always active. <laughs> so I have time to convince them that, you know, passive so does, does work, but they say, you know, Roger, uh, does go active. So just, it depends on uh, what Brandon earlier said. It depends sometimes on what customers are it takes. We listen, we provide uh, solutions. And sometimes uh, based on risk management, we have to provide both active and passive, and then the yeah. customer will decide uh, which one uh, to choose. So that's my opinion thank you excellent excellent um Mikhail, from a from an airline's perspective uh, obviously you know choices are somewhat limited and you're very much um not dictated to but you you ultimately have to move what's handed to you give us your thoughts in respect of the of the active v passive uh solutions and systems Oh yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Yes, from my airline perspective, uh, it is uh, it is uh, a more deep question that that, that probably you can imagine because uh, uh, we are the global airline and uh, there are different conditions. For example, in transatlantic routes than to Asia, and uh, uh, everything starting from the risk assessment by our customers and whatever conditions and whatever selection of our customers are. Uh, we have to go follow and we have to check what is possible, what is not. Of course, the most common temperature range, 2 to 8, uh, is uh, usually uh, very possible uh, in a passive system because the, our fleet of the, uh, of the Boeing 787 is equipped uniquely into the uh, temperature controlled front deck. So we usually uh, are trying to force with the passive system because we can pass all the requirements. However, some very, uh, some very demanding goods like uh, insulin, for example, needs to be uh, sent to very uh, difficult destinations when, for example, there is a hot temperature af after arrival. So uh, definitely the first is the communication with the customer. The second is the conditions that we have to pass. Third is the handling, of course, uh, and uh, capabilities of the handling agent, especially at the destination place. Do not overheat anything to keep the temperature range and to hand over the goods in the same condition that the shipper required and of course the consignee is ready to absorb. Uh, last not least, it's very very important in case, for example, for the active system and the containers equipped in the dry ice. is especially uh, very important for Asian routings because we are flying uh, above the countries, a lot of many, many countries. Some of them, they are very restricted in the dangerous goods when, for example, the dry ice is uh, in some kind of container. So we have to check the route uh, if uh, something is possible. But generally, uh, generally, it's everything is between, uh, decision is between uh, the conditions that the customer requires and, of course, the risk assessment. We, as an airline, uh, with the CIV Pharma certification, we have to be also ready for everything. So yeah. that's why uh we have uh, lease deals with all uh, major players on the market 
And normally the selection is going by the customer. We are not trying to force them, but the passive system is um, more uh, using by us than active currently. Perfect. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Mike, Mike Meek, and I know we've discussed this in the past in respect of DHL service offerings. You're in a slightly, sometimes I believe, unique situation where you can influence the decision, but sometimes then you obviously have to accept the decision of the customer. What are your thoughts in respect of the of the different types of, of technologies, the active v passive? Yeah, very much like uh, what, what everybody else has said. So yeah, also good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, there are an, a number of uh, factors that play in, Henry. As you say, um, one of the things for us might start at a very high level, uh, the different types of logistics models that we have. Um, so if we sort of go through what's happening currently with COVID-19 vaccines and we're handling a variety of uh, different temperatures from ultra low temperatures um, to maybe two to eight, whatever they may be. Um, we, we have ways of either shipping stuff direct, so it could come straight out of the manufacturer's plant direct into those countries. Um, and then we've got other solutions where we may be doing the traditional logistics of cross docking, all of the freight around the globe. And then you've got the in-country solutions that we have. And sometimes you might see on some of our direct shipments is very much built around passive. And then you might see on a lot of our, what I would call in-country direct, where we have, let's say, ULT freezer farms at one extreme. Well, then we're very much in, we start in the uh, active. And also you'll probably find we go active, passive, active, passive, you know, along the supply chain. So we're uh, switching those things. I think there's a number of other things that people have mentioned. That it's a good point about customer preference and also what's being validated. Um, so as Roger said, I, I come across that quite a lot. We work with some manufacturers. They need you to work quickly and they already have a preference. We, I think we must handle virtually every known uh, passive uh, suppliers equipment somewhere. And likewise, we handle a lot of active equipment. Um, and then we may have uh, a client that says, okay, for these reasons, a bit like Mike had said on the, uh, the Janssen type situation, we will be given guidance because we already have those supplies or they may supply the packaging. Um, during the COVID uh, situation, we've worked a lot with governments. So it's really weird what's happening in the supply chains that in some geographies we're working direct with the, the manufacturer and then shipping. But then sometimes we receive it and we're working for, let's say, the German government or the Australian government or uh, whichever government agency it is. And sometimes that's where they might not have those set up standards. So they come to, you know, the logistics provider like DHL to say, well, what would you recommend? And we would say, in this particular country, we have this solution. Um, so we, we would say whether it be passive or active. We do have, um, and I think a couple of guys mentioned the risk area. Uh, DHL, with one of our um, uh, business units, our uh, global freight forwarding, they have a, a risk management tool. And you can put in there all of the different parameters. So you say, I need to go from, let's say, hers in Belgium and I've got to go to Hong Kong and you can put in and it will say, well, if you're going on that route with this, we would recommend these solutions because everything that we do and I wear the quality and regulatory hat has to go through qualification and validation. So, um, so we will pick the stuff that we've done. Otherwise, the other thing you need to do, there might be other solutions. You've got to go out there and qualify it and validate it. Uh, well, some cases is validating you definitely got to qualify the routes and that takes time so you might be sending passive and active dummy shipments to test which is right you know if you, you're going down a different uh, route so in summary we use both um there are other factors as i said about size volumes are we talking small packs are we talking pallets um and uh from that using our tools it will come up with this is the best but i would say in probably 80 percent of the cases 
that decision has uh, taken for us and we just comply with whatever uh, type of pa uh, packaging, you know, we're asked to handle. Excellent. Yeah. So okay. there's a, there's, there's obviously clearly a combination of factors that influ influence our choice. If I might just slightly digress here, do we, do we find, do we find within the industry that, you know, from a shipper's perspective, we're, we're being more relied upon in, in the experience and knowledge that we have to give advice to shippers um, as opposed to just accepting decisions or what, what's your feeling? You know, do we feel that, you know, organizations are relying on us with our knowledge within the supply chain to be able to provide good decisions and, and, and experience of using different types of technology? Well, I, I, from my, my perspective and my experience, um, quite a lot of this goes through some sort of like commercial tender and there's due diligence taking place. And it could be um, within particular, and there's also a lot of um, what you might call um, subcontracting with carriers in the loop. So there are so many uh, factors um, and um, you will find that if you're dealing with the manufacturers, they will go through a, a rigorous process to check they've got those things, you know, covered off, especially as Mike uh, said, you know, there's a lot of companies out there where one vial, we're talking multi thousand dollars per vial product versus maybe something which is relatively cheap. Um, so with all of those decisions, you know, people are quite rigorous with, with their uh, process. But it is interesting as well. We're always asked, well, what is your, you know, preference? So we do have set up with our own suppliers um, our preference of packaging and active. So we, we can work it both ways. If I could direct that question, I guess, also to, to Mike Slip and being a shipper, how how... How much experience, how much knowledge do you rely on within the supply chain stakeholders to to provide that advice in re, in relation to your choice? Yeah, I would say very much and increasingly so. Um, if I just go back to the COVID vaccine, you know at what kind of speed this was developed. So when we started this, we didn't know anything. We only know that this platform to make a vaccine can be at minus 20 and will have some time at 2 to 8. But already was quite clear, we have to go to minus 20. We didn't know which customers, we didn't know in which countries, we didn't know from how fast it should be, we didn't know the, uh, the size of the packages. So we, we really did rely on our stakeholders in the market and persons here as panelists um, there to, to reach out and get advice. How to do intermediate storage, uh, as uh, Mike Meekin pointed out, from, it's not just from one from the beginning to the end. Do we maybe have to transfer somewhere? So yes, we, we did reach out and eventually we came up with two active and two passive containers, which have been validated. And, um, and that's also where we stop now. We don't want to have so much more choice. We, we really rely heavily there on the stakeholders. Perfect. So we change, uh, we change our strategy here slightly, uh, talking particularly around experience. And, and by that, I think we're kind of sort of practical experience of using different types of, of systems. So if I could perhaps ask, uh, you know, from an airline's perspective, Mikhail, give us, give us some practical challenges, give us some practical experiences that you've had when we compare that active, you know, versus passive system. Oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the... Uh... Difficult question, exactly. So I need a few minutes to, to, to explain what the airline uh, uh, have a challenges with that. So the passive system is relatively easy. We as an airline, of course, and the responsible partner, uh, we have the technology and we have our thermal blankets uh, selected from the various uh, suppliers, but the, the, the one with, uh, where we choose is in our opinion the best and uh, we, uh, we deliver that to our shippers, to our partners, to our customers. And this is relatively easy because uh, if you know the technology, if you know how to correctly wrap up all, all this package that you have uh, with uh, a very, very, uh, very good quality thermal blanket, everything is fine. We can absorb, handle, and everything is going smooth, especially that you have it to two to eight temperature degrees or even higher, but not lower, of course. Uh, our planes are equipped in the uh, in the in the chamber 
uh, in the front uh, cargo deck uh, in temperature controlled. I personally check it from the cockpit during the flight, so <laughs> done working. And uh, it's, it's relatively easy. But uh, with the active containers, of course, this is the, uh, let's say, uh, most complicated journey because we have a multiple selection of that. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, the equipment uh, which needs to have be filled out by the dry ice. And this is the most challenging situation around because they need the batteries, they need the dry ice, but the challenge for the airline is especially the dangerous goods and the possibility to fly over the countries because the dry ice, of course, they have a limitation of the amount of the dry ice inside of the one plane into one flight and the countries, of course. This is the limitation, especially in Asia, that, for example, if you fly from the center of Europe, like a Poland is located, uh, to China, uh, you need to go across the countries that some of them, they required uh, additional uh, permissions or they are not permitted, for example, for the fly with the dangerous goods on the solid way. So uh, uh, our, let's say, uh, the challenge in, in case of that, that the shipper uh, has validated the container uh, with the dry ice, sometimes could be impossible to go. And this is the challenge. So we say, no, uh, we will not risk. This is not possible. But uh, other containers that uh, are present on the market last years, especially uh, previous year and this year uh, on the big promotion that is the hybrid technology. This is the still active containers. So they are not the passive system, but uh, we have experienced very, very good experience with the hybrid containers that they still can keep the temperature five days that you required. They are very easy to handle. And uh, also they are not equipped in the dangerous goods. Another challenge is of course, the, all these uh, temperature detectors Mm -hmm. especially the active ones, because not every plane and not every technology is allowed to be on board. So sometimes the devices, who, for example, uh, are sending the signal all the time, they are not, uh, they are not uh, possible to be carried by the plane. So uh, it's a lot of the new technologies. We have to be sure that something is possible, something is not. That's why the dialogue with the shippers and the freight forwarders is a top important, mm -hmm. and we have to continue to do that. Last not least is the infrastructure of the handling agents at the airport of destination. Very, very important because uh, we noted a lot of bad experience. Of course, we have a good as well, but the bad experience is sometimes that uh, some uh, unexperienced, uh, unexperienced uh, the handling agent could open, for example, active container and unload the, uh, the goods and the handover just, you know, there's the pure, uh, pure cartons from inside. This is not acceptable. Sometimes, of course, is uh, going like this. That's why uh, the controlling of all the process is very, very important. So, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of challenges and experienced uh, airlines must know where is the trick, where is the risk, and uh, also be in touch with, uh, with uh, the shipper, the most important, not less important to be also uh, in touch with the consignee. And uh, for sure, handling agents on both sides. Yeah, really important, the handling agents. Um, yeah, thanks. So, Brendan, I, I know you and I have had a discussion in the past in respect perhaps of some of the operational challenges that you've come across or experiences that you've had. In the, in the active versus passive system. Um, t tell us your thoughts from, from, your, from your point of view. Yeah, well, I think, you know, to, to compound what other people have been talking about, you know, the choice between the two is, is um, you know, one that takes a lot of dialogue. Um, experiences with each really is that when things go right, you know, they both have the, the, the perfect um, solution. Um, but it's it's almost when, when, when things are, are not going too well, then obviously you face particular challenges with each. Um, active containers, you know, they're great, they're easy to load, you just turn them on and off to go. Uh, any really, any, any delays in the in the supply chain don't really affect them so much because they can just be kept on. Um, obviously with the, you know, the, the passive option, um, a lot more man hours at the beginning maybe, um, a little bit more complicated to pack. But once it's packed and you know that it's going to get there on time, on schedule, everything should be okay. Um, I think one of our recent examples of um, experience was that we 
and, and, and this really topically uh, was something to do with Brexit um, in the, the screening uh, process from the UK to Europe and then it was going off to South America. So the screening had to be done twice um, if it was going to go by road. Um, we decided it was going to fly to Brussels and then from Brussels to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to, uh, to Brazil. Um, Some way along that supply chain, uh, the active container was opened uh, and not closed properly. Um, and of course, for a solution that, that should be, you know, perfectly usable, turned on, you know, everything should be fine, uh, ended up not being so. Because I think from experience, when things go wrong with the active container, the, the, the outcome is, is, well, it's catastrophic, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, it's just game over. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, whereas I guess with passive containers, our experience is that, that generally it goes to plan and it, it arrives how it should. And, but obviously if time delays kick in, you know, if the freight's offloaded for one reason, then obviously the, 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 the plan B then needs to kick in of, of replenishing the dry ice or um, changing what containers that you've got the product in. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think uh, all the stakeholders do the job they're supposed to do. Um, and whatever, whatever containers we choose, you know, the, the benefits of each um, really do come to fruition. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's great to work in a, in a field where all the stakeholders have the same common goal, you know, and, and, are, and are always positive and, and, and very on the ball of getting the product where it needs to be and how it needs to get there. Perfect. Um, Roger, same, same question to you, really. We see a lot of, uh, we lot of, see a lot of uh, social media activity from SFS uh, Pharma Logistics in relation to moving vaccines into, into Asia. Give us your thoughts in your experience, your practical experience of the two different types of systems. Yeah, hi, thanks, Henry, again. So uh, for SFS, uh, because we are a specialty Korea company, unfortunately, 70% of the uh, decision is made by us. So the customer say, okay, you carry it, you decide it. And only 30%, they say, hey, use this container. But when it comes to vaccines, uh, 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 especially vaccines uh, from different temperature ranges, uh, from the US or Europe into Southeast Asia country, then that's where, you know, we make sure we manage the risk assessment and also the infrastructure. Because if you mess up with vaccines, you know, your name get a broadcast and you never can recover <laughs> from this spot. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so when, when you, so when, when we were told that we had to collect vaccines from, from, uh, from uh, Poland into uh, Taiwan, then that becomes a challenge. So whether we use active or use passive, and then we look at the amount of uh, payload. So, and also we look at our, at our partner capabilities and also the infrastructure. And then we decided to go with, uh, with an active solution because it's uh, yeah. more risk adverse. It's easy to operate. Um, if there's any delays, it's easy for uh, any of the partners to just plug in and uh, ch uh, charge it, of course. And yeah. of course, uh, in, in, uh, in countries like uh, North Asia, Taiwan, there's not many network stations. So it's easier to return to the airline after you deliver to the consignee. Um, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, uh, uh, when, when we do uh, shipments from, from the US into China, because we have a very strong uh, infrastructure in, in China, so I would prefer to go on a passive solution because we can uh, hibernate or recharge the containers easy for us to deliver to the consignee and then uh, return back to a network station uh, at the local uh, local depots. So um, uh, for me, the most important is always looking into infrastructure uh, within the SFS uh, network and also the risk management uh, because we have to present the entire plan to the client because when things go very wrong, I got no one to turn to, they didn't look at us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that's how we, we look at things. For Singapore, it's pretty straightforward because uh, both the active and the passive container, they're all in Singapore. So regardless of whether you use active or passive, it's very easy because uh, you can return to a local depot. So but for Southeast Asia, it's a challenge. You have to look, talk about return logistics and uh, yeah. whether when you bring a yeah. container into the country, can you bring it out of the country to the to the depot? So many, many factors to consider. And that's 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 um, what makes us different, uh, complex logistics uh, yeah. to find a yeah. solution to the to our clients. Thank you. Yeah, great, Roger. Thanks. I see. I see Mike Meekin smiling up there in relation to Brendan sharing his experiences on some of the some of the challenges. Mike, give us give us your thoughts from the from an operational perspective. Uh, your experience of of the two systems. Yeah, I think uh, what Brendan said was bang on. Around you know, if you follow the process, you set it right, you ship it. Doesn't matter whether it's active or passive. You've qualified that. It should go to, according to plan. And then uh, Brandon gave his couple of experiences like uh, where things have changed in the supply chain 
where things don't quite go according to plan. And I can think of maybe three other examples from experiences which might uh, affect one's decision on whether to go passive or active. One was, uh, I recall, uh, because in, in our company, and I think it's the same, and Roger just said it, you've probably got three different types of uh, shipping uh, solutions. You might have couriers, where we're talking very high value things, and it might be that you've got a person actually going with the goods uh, almost. Um, so you've got that, you know, the, 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 the cotton gloves around the product and you're, you're treating it like, uh, you know, you just, it's got to go through the courier system. The next one you might have down is a very highly regulated temperature controlled solution. So you could say it's GD, GCCMP plus. It's uh, and all companies probably have their uh, different type of solution where you're saying it's their, I don't know, the gold standard, the five star approach because there is a premium. And in reality, and we all know this, people don't often like paying for the so called premium services. They're happy for it to go general cargo. And then it's a case of, well, okay, if the package, the passive packaging's right, it goes general cargo, it'll be fine. Well, if you do that, you're taking a huge risk, and especially if you've got high value, very temperature sensitive products. Um, I'll give a good ex example. We were shipping products through Morocco into North Africa, and it sort of comes on to how do you get like vaccines to the end area. And we found every shipment that if we went through a certain airline, when it got into Casablanca, the drugs were being frozen. So we had two to eight sensitive drugs, and we were finding when it got to the point they'd been down to minus five. And that had everybody baffled. And um, what we did, we actually checked and audited one of the airline's fridges, which would be operating at two to, five, two to eight, and it's actually set at minus five, five. So when the stuff was coming off the aircraft and it was going through a particular route through a particular airline, we, we, we were freezing the product. I also recall incidents, and this is another factor, sometimes the packaging's robust, but the issue is to do with all of the temperature monitoring that goes with it. How many times do you come across things like somebody hasn't pressed the button to say start on the <laughs> temp tail? And then whatever happens, you've then got the nightmare at the other end. Or I have come across somebody's taken out. They've not stopped the loggers. And then the loggers have gone into a freezer or somewhere. And you get this weird reaction. And then you're thinking, you know, product... Uh, contaminate. But one good thing I've seen during COVID has been some clever ways of using some of these gateways uh, with using Bluetooth and other technologies where we were also, along with whether it's active or passive, a lot better monitoring because that can, it, it can skew, you know, maybe the packaging gets the blame and it isn't. It's the, the other sort of uh, processes around it. And then I think Another interesting one is probably less so now, but I remember when we used to ship via Egypt, um, and it didn't. It was that was probably more with active containers, but uh, when it went through like customs, as Brendan was mentioned, we were finding that the temp tails were being stolen. <laughs> when they got to a certain point, I don't know whether they were stolen or just taken out and not put in or what. But we did go through a spate where uh, cargo would turn up. So this all comes back to the whole thing about qualifying, knowing your roots and knowing what's best and knowing your geography as well. Perfect. Excellent. Um, I know all of you have mentioned the topic of, of risk. Um, so I guess it would be, uh, it would be risk, remiss of us not to talk about the topic of risk. So when we talk about trends in the market, uh, in regards sort of risk and compliance and, and liability, I suppose that's also a word we could use in, in relation to your choices. How does that influence, how does that ultimately uh, influence your choice and what kind of trends do you see going forward in, in the future in regards risk, compliance and, and liability? And we've had a question in also talking specifically in regard to the sort of product safety in respect of the two different types of systems. So maybe we can include that, that question in there as well. M Mike Slippin, can I ask you to give us your thoughts in regards risk compliance and liability and and the potential of of what we see from a from a future trends point of view 
Yeah, well, I'm working for one company, right? So for me, it's maybe the trend is a bit difficult to see. I can only tell what in my company, how we value the risk and what we're doing to it. Um, so I think it was Roger who said from, in, in terms of the, the current vaccines, the COVID vaccines, there's not much you can do right, but there's a lot you can do wrong. We have so much troubles within the supply chain, the manufacturing part of the, uh, of the product. We are far behind of schedule. I can share that here. It's in the newspapers. Um, really nothing should go wrong with the shipment, which many people think, oh, that's just um, a common right. The product manufacturing is the, the difficult part. The shipment should be the easy part. We, we really look there at the risk and we are very much um, looking to reduce the risk as much as possible. Now, as I said, we cannot just change to, um, because often people say from, okay, then go to active. Active is less risk. I share that, but not from technical perspective, always possible. Um, I think what we see is that um, with the passive containers, when I started with about 17 years ago, uh, we start with a styrofoam box. If you look at the current passive containers, I think there's a lot of mitigation within the development of the passive containers. They got so much better. So I, from my perspective as a customer, I'm not so much afraid of anymore to use the passive container. So I think even for higher um, value products, now passive containers are well accepted. Perfect. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, um, and I guess that's kind of where the where the, the the tower guys come in from a from a passive point of view. And I think it's it's kind of nice that you've you know mentioned. I think a lot of you mentioned about the sort of the stability and the safety of the of the of the passive system. Um, perhaps also from a from a from a forwarder's perspective, um, Mike Meekin, give us give us your thoughts in regards sort of particularly. I guess I'm interested in the compliance element, bear, bearing in mind where your you know, situated within the, the DHL supply chain group. What, what's your thoughts on those future tens on, on compliance? Um, well, I would just say in, compliance is increasing. Um, we were fortunate, I think, as an industry um, during COVID that some of the drug regulators were, um, uh, how would you say it? Um, they weren't as maybe uh, as strict with the timings around qualification, especially when we were bringing in, um, setting up freezer farms with ULTs, which is very much on the, uh, the active uh, start of the process. Um, but then when we were looking at first to handle the MNRA vaccines, you know, the ones that are minus uh, 70, minus 80, one of the things that does come in when you look at the, the compliance was the need to do a lot of uh, qualification and validation and lots of studies um, and having the evidence that you do do that stuff. And I think that's just going to increase. Uh, it's only going to go one way. It's not going to get relaxed. Um, but um, one of the experiences that we had at first, there weren't that many active containers around that could handle, because um, we were obviously looking, we, we could store it, but if you needed to ship something at an inactive, there were not that many pieces of equipment. And the only ones that I knew was things like, um, which was on the passive side, AD 400D sub pallet box. And that, that's an excellent uh, piece of equipment, tried and tested. And basically as a good, as Mark had just pointed out, you've got a, a shell, put it very simply, that is robust and can you know last for so many days, and then you fill, you know, to the required levels of dry ice in it. And we all know that that's a nice, simple solution. So from a patient safety perspective, as long as it's packed right, um, you can't really go wrong. Whereas when it's got electricity, if that's its active means to keep it at a certain temperature and you get a power failure or you get something, active systems can, when they fail, it's catastrophic. With a uh, passive, you've probably got a bit of time because that's what it is. It's how much time have I got with this dry ice or if with two to eight, the face change or the gel packs or whatever is being put in. And that, that raises another bit, I think, around this. And that's people and processes. Quite a lot of these systems have to change. You know, some people will oper operate with a winter or a summer pack out. And if you've got the more, I find, complexity you build into solutions with processes, 
And at one time, if we go back, I don't know, 10, 15 years, the trend would be on a certain date, you change from winter to summer type configurations, depending where you were in the world, if that was relevant. And as we all know, we've probably had in parts of Europe a warmer September than we probably had in August. And uh, you could be in a situation where you switch and then you find out, no, you, you've got your switch. So you need to be a, a bit more um, uh, proactive with uh, temperatures. So I would say, yeah, compliance definitely increasing. We need to get a lot more scientific with our, um, uh, you know, whether it's our operational qualifications. Um, and I, I think last year we also... Um, we, we did quite a lot of work when we were trying to get around this issue on how to ship. And we did come up with stuff with we're working with people like uh, Tower, where we were able to get palletized units where you could keep them at minus 70 yeah. for over a week. And that, that was a game changer because up until then, you could probably handle um, some palletized cargo in, whether it be reefer type units or... Um, you know, envirotainers, vacutainers, and all the other um, types of units on short shipments. Then having a palletized deep frozen type uh, package, uh, which you could demonstrate through the compliance of the validator. For me, that was a bit of a game changer because all of a sudden, this time last year, there wasn't a solution. And within a few weeks after that of testing and doing trials, we did come up with some innovative uh, solutions. Yeah, brilliant. And I, mean, I know the Tower guys have worked extensively hard in providing that kind of deep frozen solution to the industry. And it's, as you say, it's very in it, innovative and, and, and much needed uh, in respect of, you know, a, a service offering. Um, Mikhail, from a liability point of view, future trends, uh, unfortunately, I think we kind of feel the airlines are sometimes at the end of the chain and the ones always to blame and that's not always the case and and i also think that you know mike meekin makes a really good point about processes and procedures and you alluded to that from a training point of view so you have a you have a very complex system to work with that is as we've said outsourced to many different organizations talk to us a little bit about I guess, risk and liability from an airline point of view and how you see that maybe changing in the future? Ah, yes, uh, that's an important, uh, important question, especially now, uh, still uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, my answer, I have to divide uh, between the traditional pharmaceuticals and, uh, and, and uh, temperature controlled cargo of uh, vaccines and the tests for the COVID-19. So the first, uh, the first, uh, the selection is yes, of course. The um, let's say the treat of the kind of cargo is of course uh, is of course uh, much more adult than in the past. Yes, the people are uh, the people are um, more educated. Excuse me. Excuse uh, me. Excuse me. Uh, and, uh, and the situation is that the, the, the people and the companies are more adult. They are going into the, also the more checking in the, the risk assessment to optimize the route than only, for example, the select only devices. So this is the big difference. So now today, the optimization of the, of the, of the routings uh, is going to be very, very important, uh, a very important topic. In the past, rather the device was on the, on the number one. So today, uh, of course, after a lot of failures, uh, shippers, uh, shippers, they get the lesson, of course. Uh, they get the lesson, uh, they are more, uh, more uh, stable. They don't want to risk so much. And uh, what I said about the hybrid technology, which is, uh, which is a top important to mention right now is, that this technology is between some kind of the between the passive and active, and uh, uh, this technology, hybrid technology, uh, has a lot, a lot of benefits that we see. Our customers they see it, and also uh, they are pretty resistant for the failures at the airports by the handling agents, uh, which are mostly the key. Uh, with the vaccines and all this related for the COVID nineteen, I see. <laughs> We observe the shocking situation uh, all, 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 all over the world. 
Uh, it's other also airport, especially you. We saw a lot of integrators that they treat the uh, the vaccines or the tests like a normal standard cargo. It's going by the sorting machines and the loading to the truck that normally is carried the televisions or the core computers. So we were shocked to see that, and uh, we saw it, and uh, we really ask ourselves what's going on here around. I personally was involved in the, the checking the one of the tests uh, worth hundreds of thousands US dollars that was overheat by the one of leading, uh, one of the leading uh, the, uh, the courier. So I was also shocked. But after the shock passed and what Mike said, of course, when this uh, crisis came, nobody had the time for the risk assessment. Nobody had the time to check, to, to select everything. And the behind uh, is very important. With this COVID-19 uh, crisis, when it happened, that was a lot of politics. Mm -hmm. And the politicians, they are not matter what is effective, what is good, uh, if time is needed or not. They wanted to have the uh, results immediately. They wanted to have the vaccines, whatever risk is on the place. That's why we saw a lot of, a lot of very demanding cargo treat like a normal standard cargo. So that was a shock for us. Uh, mostly it's gone, but still after, for example, European Union, is feeding uh, by the vaccines uh, centralized from the Brussels by European Commission. All this risk is absolutely not accepted by the people from the industry, but it happened and probably happening right now as well. But uh, this adult part of the business, in my opinion, is going more, uh, more adult, more, uh, more responsible way, uh, is checking also by the optimization for the routings, for the uh, for also the reduction all the all the transit we as an airline also we prefer to have the customers with no transit uh, if we go for example as an airline with uh, on the SPA or some interline deal with other airline and we are the part of the supply chain we're trying to avoid the situation like this or clearly in a very very important way inform that uh, we are responsible only for our part and we do not suggest something which is very, very risky. Customers, they are leasing us. So yes. uh, at least when the politics are involved, is it dangerous? The risk is absolutely lower. In case that uh, we, uh, we have uh, partners uh, with responsible companies as going higher and more adult than in the past. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, I guess the, the more interfaces in the supply chain, the more the the risk increases. Definitely. I think we all we all see that. And that, I guess, is also one of those challenges between that, you know, that passive system. And Brendan mentioned it, the idea that if we set it up properly and, and, and we do it right to begin with, it, it just flows through the system with with limited amount of uh, of um, you know of of risk and interaction. Roger, in respect of your thoughts on future trends on on compliance on risk, on liability. Uh, I guess from an Asia perspective, where, where do you see where do you see those future trends going? Yeah, I think everyone now this, uh, you know, in the old days, it was used to be looking at the uh, packaging company, the containers, uh, collocation report, and then, okay, this, this is it. But nowadays, that document is no longer valid. So the first thing they ask you, what's your experience uh, handling uh, vaccines or certain kind of uh, commodity? No one wants to be a guinea pig, you know, to give it to someone and then for, for you to mess it up. And secondly, is that um, um, what, what I expect from, especially for, for my company is that, uh, have you done lane qualification? That's the number one. Have you ever used this container? Okay, uh, what's your experience? How many times have you used it? Where do you use it uh, uh, elsewhere? Does your partner, does your partner have, uh, know how to operate containers? And then the next thing that uh, um, um, the future trend will be on BCP. So we are doing our vaccines uh, collecting from the US to Southeast Asia. I think the key thing is that besides uh, routing is very important, as far as possible, you go on direct flight. Where direct flight is not possible, you go indirect flight. That's where it gets more complicated. And um, you have to address every milestone of, uh, from the time you pick up the uh, vaccines down to uh, delivery. You have to cover contingency. What happens if the truck breaks down? How are you going to transfer the vaccines from truck A to truck B? What happens if you use an active or passive? If the active, if the truck breaks down or battery power failure, what's going to happen next? So it's, it gets very complicated when it comes to liability. And then next, it comes to insurance. I think uh, uh, for my experience, uh, not, ma not many insurance companies want to cover uh, you know, things like vaccines or coaching products. 
So they, they actually had to audit you and then and make sure that you know your company is very compliant uh, before they even uh, you know cover you for a temperature uh, excursion. So it's not a gift given that you pay the money, you get automatic uh, cover. They need to you need to explain to the uh, underwriter uh, your your business contingency plan, yeah. the, the selection yeah. of containers, all the reports, tons of loads of things that you have to submit uh, before you you know they're willing to insure uh, insure it. So for the future trends, uh, no longer about just selecting a container, you have to you have to talk about BCP. What happens when things go wrong? So they don't take things for changes anymore. So that you, from the start to finish, everything is uh, covered and uh, everything is uh, crystal clear. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. What the what if planning? What what ha what happens if something goes wrong? Yeah, we talk a lot about contingency planning. Brendan, give us give us your thoughts in regards to the future trends. I guess thinking predominantly, you know, where risk is going to go. What what's going to change? What, what challenges are you going to face? Yeah, well, I think certainly from a, from a forwarder's point of view, we we are most of the time a conduit between um, all the different stakeholders in the supply chain. So whilst we're working with shippers, sometimes manufacturers, airlines, um, and then usually another forwarder, either at the beginning or the end of the chain, um, there's, there's definitely a sense of a shared, um, I, I'm not going to call it a shared risk, but we all understand um, equally uh, what the risks are. And for us really in future trends, I think it's, and, and, and you know, this panel is, is testament to that, is that... Um, Training is really important. And, and you know, I was lucky enough to, to do some training with Roger uh, a few years ago. So the confidence that I've got now in, in the other stakeholders is increasing year on year uh, because there's, there's just more, there's just more sharing of information. There's a, there's a shared goal that's, that's increasing all of the time that we all know what needs to be done at each part of the supply chain. Um, whereas before, you know, there may have been a lack of confidence in other parts of the supply chain. That certainly is disappearing now. And I think it's disappearing because the, the increase in training, the increase in certification and validation, it's all going in the right direction. And of course, the, you know, the innovation in the packaging, um, you know, is, is, is continuing all the time. Um, I think from a, from a risk perspective, you know, the, the risk profile of the product would usually determine the, the container that's used. Um, but future trends, and, and I think Roger's mentioned quite a lot there, and, and Mike also, um, is that, you know, as, as the, the vaccine, I guess, reaches more and more destinations, um, I think another, another step up in the level of, of flexibility and pre-planning and um, looking at routes, you know, is going to become even more important. Um, but it is, it, is, it is, from our point of view, comforting um, that when we're working with I guess smaller shippers usually, you know, and as a, and as a smaller forwarder, you know, in, in relation to, to DHL, for example, we're working with a lot of startup companies who don't always understand um, the importance of the certification and validation of A, the product, and B, the partners that they want to use. Um, and in putting in, in a lot of trust in us to make those decisions for them, and that's where we, we get the, you know, the comfort, um, from knowing that we've got partners in, in whichever part of the supply chain um, who, who equally understand the risk elements and, and how you, you know, counter each part of that. Yeah, it's great. I think you're right. I think it's really interesting that I think there's a far greater awareness of the risk now. And I think it's actually becoming an open conversation. I think, you know, maybe historically in the past, forwarders shippers airlines have kind of kept themselves to themselves but we are all having a dialogue now and we are all saying to each other we have to work in a collaborative way otherwise the risk you know the risk increases and i think if we share those um, experiences and share our thoughts and and ultimately you know ensure those processes are uniform and standard we are only benefiting you know the the reducing the risk and ultimately you know benefiting the the supply chain uh, at the same time yeah. it's it's yeah, it's course, really true just 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 to add to that i guess it's it's really important to know that, that each time you do training yourself and each time you increase your own knowledge you of course then increasing the the um i guess highlighting the, what, what you know the other partners need to be doing as well because until you train yourself you, you're not really sure what they should be doing um, so it, it's, it's really comforting for us to know that the airlines have made a real big, you know, step up in that, you know, shippers 
have as well, manufacturers do. And, and certainly from our point of view, as a, as a smaller freight forwarder, it's been in a network of, of fellow forwarders who also understand that, you know, I use Roger as one example of that. And I guess also from a packaging point of view, you know, organizations like Tower are providing a, a, a lot of in-depth um, education in respect of the, of the different packaging solutions, how they're put together, how they're handled through the chain. So, um, yeah, no, definitely. It's, 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 it's really good. Um, okay, so let's move on perhaps to our final question, uh, which uh, is uh, obviously a, a really important topic to us at the moment. You know, with the increasing need uh, to deliver vaccines uh, more and more now to sort of remote areas, um, and particularly, you know, in uh, certain areas of, of the developing, you know, the developing world, uh, what do we think uh, that is ultimately going to affect our choice of active versus passive? So, you know, from a, from a developed countries, we're beginning to see, you know, great uptake in vaccine. Perhaps our next big supply chain and logistical challenge is to get it to developing countries. Roger, from your perspective, what are your thoughts? What are, what are, your, what are your, um, your opinions in respect of, um, you know, what, what challenges will you face? What is going to ultimately influence your choice? I think it's a temperature that, that the kind of vaccine is going to deliver to the uh, end user, the kind of temperature ranger. Sometimes, you know, example, minus 20 vaccines. You don't have much choices with uh, active. You have to go with uh, passive. But yeah. when it comes to two to eight, you have a wide variety. You have both active and passive. And of course, uh, you know, uh, we talk about delivering to remote places. End of the day, it's will come to cost. You, you, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a blank check that you can just you know, charge whatever you want. So uh, the, the, the stakeholders will look at cost. So that, that will also decide uh, um, our choice on whether we use an active or passive um, uh, or selection of our packaging solutions. Excellent. Um, Mike Meakin, give us, give us your thoughts in, in regards to the, the active versus passive choice to developing countries. Yeah, um, I think it's going to still be uh, a mixed solution. Um, I think, um, like the example I gave about shipping via Morocco, that was to actually move rare disease drugs into the Sahara countries. And I'm talking, we've been doing that for years. And uh, that was a passive uh, solution. Um, and that's why we ended up with the issue with how people at the different um Miles, miles points in the supply chain can, can cause things to go wrong. And that could happen with active or uh, passive. Um, I think if we're having to still ship MNRA vaccines, which are the very deep frozen, ultra low temperature solutions, we, 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 we do have uh, solutions to be able to handle that. And uh, Tower, you know, the good thing is you've got a product that's been on the market for years which can you know it's less than a pallet size and you can get it um, to somewhere and you'll keep it at those ultra low temperatures for a, a week so being able to get something there from let's say brussels to uh, senegal or wherever it may be or to remote areas i think there are uh, solutions if we use the you know the the main types of equipment out there so i think it's still going to be a bit of both um, there are some countries I hear do have issues with dry ice, so that might be a decider to say, well, we might need a different type of thing. What um, Michael's also been saying from uh, the, the, the Polish sort of perspective around hybrids, that, that's uh, I, I agree with. Um, the other interesting one we're currently dealing with, as there's a move of, let's say, COVID vaccines from high income countries to low income countries, and you've got, you know, organizations like Gavi, UNICEF, the COVAX types of uh, shipments, which are going on hand in hand with the, uh, the other rollouts of countries that bought vaccines early, has been now, we're closing down vaccination centers in a lot of countries because most adults up to a point have been, so whether it be Germany, the UK, the US, there are vaccines now being returned from vaccination centers and trying to keep them at the right temperature mm -hmm. and then bring them back in centrally, probably put a German flag label on it and then ship it back out to 
you know, the rest of the world, um, which just makes the whole supply chains even more complex. But I just wanted to throw that in that there is, because I never foresee that, foresaw that. I thought it was all about this time last year, just trying to get the vaccines. But now what we are doing is moving vaccine. Uh, now, obviously, that, that raises all sorts of patient uh, safety uh, questions that the whoever's got the, the ownership of those vaccines is aware they are being kept, they are at the right dates, expiry dates on them, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That opens up a lot. But it, it sort of builds into this uh, solution. It needs a lot of careful planning. But I, I see it's probably going to be more the Pareto with passive than active, but they both play a significant part. Thanks, Mike. Um, Brendan, give us give us your thoughts in regards the, the the choice you know the, the the clear choice between active passive getting into those challenging countries those challenging destinations what's your thoughts yeah I, th I think by the very nature when we're talking about um the undeveloped uh, parts of the world uh, the likelihood is that there will be a limitation on the aircraft that's flying there so aircraft size you know makes a difference sometimes um, but quite often you know from I guess from a layman's point of view, we, we may talk about getting the product there, uh, but often from a logistics point of view, of course, there's, there's equipment that you need to get back. Um, and whilst infrastructure may not be where it needs to be in, in, in some of these places, in terms of the return of, of maybe, um, you know, some of the, the, the bigger active um, containers, um, it, it then just adds an additional cost to get them returned. You know, we had a recent example where we were trying to ship um, to, to a place in Brazil. The nearest return station for the box was in Miami. Um, so there wasn't, there wasn't a local station for the return, which was then of course, um, you know, the, the cost of the, the logistics part of the operation increases even more. Um, and that then deemed it was, it was just impossible for them to, to cover the cost. You know, and as Roger mentioned, there is there is no open checkbook sometimes. You know, the cost element does come into it. And um, so I think that that may have, may have an impact in terms of which which system is going to be used. Because, of course, with most uh, with most passive containers, you know, some of them are just single use. They get there, they're unloaded, and then, the you know, the materials are then um, not returned. But, but clearly with, with active containers, they usually are. Um, so if there's... Um, I think the, the, the collaboration between some of the suppliers, the rental houses of those types of equipment uh, needs to be increased. And I know that the, the, those return stations are increasing all of the time around the world. Uh, but certainly for most, we've already experienced that um, into some of the more uh, remote destinations we've been asked to ship into. Yeah, good, good, excellent. Um, Mikhail, from an airline's point of view, uh, we're assuming, or I'm, I'm boldly assuming, it's about growing your network. It's about increasing your coverage. So as you as you look to service uh, countries, perhaps you've never serviced before, maybe not necessarily in regards to the the uh, the the active passive choice. What kind of challenges are you facing from as 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 an airline getting into those types of countries? Um, you know where infrastructure can and and might well be a challenge. Oh yeah, uh, it's uh, it was very very interesting. That's probably the most important uh, the question right now. It's uh, the, the, the last. Uh, I like it very much. Uh, so we as an airline is a uh, we are in the middle of the supply chain. Sometimes it depends on the terms of the delivery. And uh, many countries like uh, like you mentioned, the developing countries or the markets, uh, they usually are uh, trying to avoid the situation where the supply chain is uh, designed to be the door door. It's rather to the airport. So uh, we as an airline, uh, we have to uh, just select uh, with whom uh, we are dealing with. Uh, means uh, if the freight forwarder uh, is the large enough or have a representation at the shipper side and consignee side. Uh, in case of this, of course, uh, we do whatever freight forwarder wants from us. Or the cheaper uh, but uh, everything is changing of course and we have to consider that uh, the situation is that we are flying to the airport that we've never been before we don't have uh, uh, we don't have a, a valid contracts and uh, any SLA is not in place with the local handler so we have to consider with whom we are dealing with in that case so 
Uh, for example, if we are flying for the airport that we don't have any proof that the local staff is equipped uh, or trained to maintain any um, developed uh, active container, it is impossible to send because uh, in case of we do on our master lease agreement, for example, we are responsible for everything what is coming uh, with the handling of the container. So uh, we never do that because this is liability, of course. Uh, first, uh, which has come to my mind is uh, the communication with the consignee. Uh, and uh, absolutely the, the, the passive system in case like this, because it is more safe for everybody and uh, push the uh, reliability for, uh, and, and of course, uh, all, uh, all aspects related to the handling uh, for the consigning. So uh, most of the case, uh, especially that, that uh, Mike mentioned about some African countries, they are very, uh, very good equipped and, uh, and uh, maintained with the passive system because they produce mostly the, the, the fruits and the vegetables and the flowers or something. So they have usually infrastructure for the cool chain, but it's not equipped so much. So the basic stuff is equipped and they know what to do. Uh, the problem is, to send them very equipped uh, containers or very developed containers with the active system. So uh, the first which came to my mind is the passive system, uh, properly wrapped up, proper, properly informed, and never, never, ever send something uh, like a missile. Send and forget. No, <laughs> it's a lot of airlines can do that or for orders. Uh, but uh, the information uh, uh, with the prior notice and the confirmation that the partner uh, understand what is necessary to do that is the responsible way for the business with the free forwarders, with the shippers and, uh, and, uh, and the local staff. Mostly, uh, I confirm that I'm a big fan of the hybrid uh, solutions in case like this, but the most uh, demanding country or the challenging country, the passive system would be enough in case that they agree uh, to get the responsibility on the last way, on the last mile. Yep. So systems like systems like the tower system, the passive system for those particularly challenging countries is 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 the is the least uh, or the the lower the low risk choice. Yeah. Perfect. Absolutely excellent. Um, Mike Slippin, if we could hand that one on to you, thinking about your your global supply chain and and your vaccine challenge. What's your thoughts on on getting those products to those developing countries, those countries that are very hard to reach, or certainly perhaps even where infrastructure um is uh, is limited yeah and uh, we have a lot of experience with that we have been shipping for 16 years we have shipping uh, pediatric vaccines that was two to eight degrees celsius should not be frozen um we shipped that to 99 percent went to unicef countries the 92 developing countries in this world definitely the most challenging so if it comes to the COVID vaccines i think the the easiest one we have done and the ones where we have locally, we have warehouses well controlled. Now we are we shipping products to those countries where indeed, as I think Michael just said, the last mile is so important. So we as a manufacturer in this situation, this urgency situation, we cannot change the package much. So it really comes to the container to make adjustments, to have it, the safe delivery that last mile and reach the, the clinics in the field. So um, what we have to do, I think, is we have to listen to the customer, in this case, UNICEF, to have requirements like maximum 30 kilogram, two people should be able to carry the box. All these things have to be taken in consideration. So that's definitely going to be a challenge. Um, plus refreezable ice packs, so that indeed the last part indeed can be still managed in cold chain, and that will be two to eight degrees Celsius, at least for our vaccine. We have three to four months, which can be at two to eight after initially 20 degrees, minus 20 degrees. So yes, definitely, this is going to be the challenge. And I think earlier your question to me was from, okay, what is your partnership with this? So that's where we need your expertise. From what kind of solutions do you see to manage that last mile? Excellent. Fantastic. So that's that's those the challenges the challenges that face us uh, in the future certainly with regards um, vaccine distribution it's it's interesting um, again from an airline's point of view to hear that I guess you've gone through a lot of challenges in 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 relation to capacity I suppose all of you have suffered from those capacity issues and it's nice to kind of think as Mike Meekin said we're getting to that point where certainly in certain countries vaccine distribution is almost 
maybe not normal, but getting close to normal. And now, as Mike said, we're, we're beginning to face challenges of reverse logistics. I mean, that's something perhaps 18 months ago we thought that would never, uh, never be a, a, a concern of ours. I'm, I'm just going to turn to to some questions that we've had in uh, in regards to today's session. Um, one of the questions we had was around um, how do we um, how do we audit different airlines? I think Mike may may have picked up on that one, but how do we how do we audit different airlines in respect of compliance? Um, how do we do it? Who does it? Um, and, and what are perhaps are the most important factors of that? So, Mike, Mike Meekin, maybe you could just quickly pick that one up for us in regards, you know, the audit you mentioned about having to physically go and do an audit of an airline where you'd had some issues. Give us some thoughts on your on your experiences of, of that process, again, from a compliance point of view. Yeah, when you're um, uh, qualifying particular routes and lanes, I mean, this type of process is, is key. One, one thing to be mindful of, um, when we all had our respective lockdowns, um, and it's probably the same the other way around, when we've had audits, it's been difficult to actually do that in the last 12 months. I would say most audits that DHL's been through in, you know, with its customers and governments have been done virtually because um, it, it is difficult to do. So that might be somebody at one end using video cameras, and you, a bit like a Zoom call or a Teams call has been the way a lot of things have been done. But that, that, that raises other challenges because some of the things you want to do is to go in and actually look at stuff. Um, one challenge I have had with audits, because that is the right thing to do, and I'm sure other people have this, sometimes it is really difficult to audit some of the airlines. Um, and it's the same with other logistics providers, as Brendan mentioned. You know, the, there's a lot of us working in the chain. And if um, a company like DHL is subcontracted on behalf of another company to do its end-to-end -end supply chain, we might then have agreements with other logistics providers or freight forwarders or integrators in that loop. So we need to set up our own back-to-back -back quality agreements and have audits. So the, th the view would be that that would be the norm. But in some cases, and I must be honest, it can be difficult and challenging with certain types, especially with companies who might be perceived as a competitor. But there are ways around it. Uh, but it, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just pointing that out. But that is the right thing to do. And I would say in the majority of cases, it is something that we do do. Um, but there are challenges. Um, that, that's what challenges at the moment because of COVID lockdowns in some geographies and then the other challenge has always been uh, because you've got to be able to get into the example with Morocco yeah we were fortunate we were able to go in and look at the particular airlines uh, infrastructure and then we found that they had a particular because depending on which airline the products went through we didn't get a problem and that's how we actually found in that particular case it was a setting inside the fridge and one of the root causes there was um was uh was a people training issue around uh, how to maintain and operate those fridges thanks mike one of the other questions we've had is in relation to um i, I guess assessing risk from a temperature perspective through a through a cold chain so people's thoughts in regards uh, the virtual cold chain uh, and using, I guess, software to be able to do those risk assessments for you, perhaps rather than or or in in, in combination with the physical element of uh, of that risk assessment or that root risk assessment. What are people's thoughts in regards to the use of of sort of you know the virtual cold chain, virtual cold chain software to do those risk assessments? Roger, have you had any experience of of using any kind of software from a risk assessment perspective? Yeah, Henry, good one for me. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I get thrown out the door if I mention about virtual <laughs> simulation. So my customer don't buy it. Unfortunately, they, everything I do is always about uh, uh, lane qualification, doing a live product uh, to a particular lane. Uh, but I think that in, in the future, what, what we are doing actually, we are going to AI. So we build up a platform uh, to, to measure both the internet and external temperature. So that will you know, save us a lot of time and trouble to actually do an actual lane qual uh, qualification, especially now in COVID times, to do a lane qualification is, is cost a lot of money. So uh, again, uh, for, for me, unfortunately for SFS, 
none of us across the 12 Asia Pacific countries, everything we present the data uh, is about uh, live data. And uh, the clients don't accept anymore uh, the qualification from the, from the uh, uh, packaging manufacturer. It's a, it's a given, uh, it's our standards. Uh, what they want is live data from us, our experience. Perfect. Um, my slip and maybe give us your thoughts in the use of sort of the virtual the virtual cold chain and, and your approach to lane verification, lane qualification. How, how does that work from your organization's perspective? Um, we are using it, um, but it's not the final step. So as uh, Roger said, we, we do require at the moment still, we, um, just as a validation, we do require the actual shipment. Um, many things can go wrong at those sites. Um, and we want to see that, um, how reliable is it really in practice. I, I think it does have a future though. Um, as, as soon as we know indeed which kind of airports have a higher risk in this and um, uh, temperature zones stuff, um, those, um, I see that software is very valuable. Um, however, it's still used at an early stage at the moment, not as the final stage for us. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Mikael, from an airline point of view, maybe not talking about the virtual cold chain, but maybe talking a little bit more about risk assessments across a, across a kind of an airline's network. What kind of technologies are you using to do that? It's, uh, uh, right now, I don't have uh, an experience with this virtual cold chain, but can imagine that, uh, as Mike uh, said before, uh, that would be the uh, usable, of course. And a part of the of the shipments, especially for the passive ones, uh, would be in place. But the validation, especially validation for the for the for the active system, definitely uh, requires to have the direct access, physical access to the devices. So uh, yes and no. Yes, for passive system, that would be a kind of solution for for, for uh, any technology which requires uh, additional steps and the training. Definitely, the physical access is necessary. That's my opinion. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks. Really good. Brendan, how about you? Thoughts on the, on the virtual cold chain? Yeah, well, I, th I think um, when virtual systems are built, um, you know, the, the, the comfort that we have is that they're typically based upon historical information of, of experiences that have already taken place and the likelihood that they're going to take place again, whether it be in a positive or a negative fashion. So I think the virtual um, cold chain platforms uh, will be particularly useful because of that. Um, and as they develop, more and more people who've been involved in it, you know, from, a, from an educated point of view, um, will make them even more, um, you know, uh, useful. I don't, you know, they're not built on just, oh, well, you know, it, it might get to this temperature, it might not in that particular part of the world. You know, they're built on the fact that we know that it gets to that temperature in that part of the world, or, you know, um, there's a specific pattern in a, in a delay or a, maybe a, you know, how long it takes to clear through customs or, you know, it, it's built on educated information. Yeah. Um, so I think the use is, is, is going to increase. And I think Mike mentioned something that they already have a, a particular system that looks at which packaging is probably most appropriate. Um, so it's nice to see that those platforms are, you know, being developed more and more. And I think particularly the, the virtual cold chain one will become very useful. In combination, as you say, between the sort of the AI technology uh, of what it could look like, but oh. based on that, I guess that in combination of that practical experience too, sometimes you can never get away from, you know, as Mike Meekin says, doing that audit in Casablanca, making sure that you can actually get to the to the core core of the problem. But I think you're right, that combination of technology and, and practical experience really does warrant um, a good, secure um, you know, qualified and, and verified uh, cold chain. So, yeah, good. Yeah, of course, because when, you know, when you do any risk assessment, you're only really looking at what's probably happened before. You know, to, to, to think of a scenario that's never happened before is, is very difficult, right? You know, we've, we've, we've all seen that um, from the outbreak of the, the COVID virus. You know, it was, a, it was a scenario very few people imagined because it's never yeah. happened before. Um, so it's nice that the, the educated approach of the virtual cold chain platform is, is now developing uh, probably at a faster rate than we thought it would. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've had another question. I think we've kind of touched on it maybe a little bit in relation to capacity. The question is the global um, freight scenario is spiking for all kinds of shipments. 
Um, I'm assuming that you know, come up to the the uh, the demand potentially outstripping the supply. Um, how active and passive solutions can help fight the spike? So, in relation to a lack of capacity, um, uh, you know, across the, the the sort of the network and airline network, uh, what measures can freight forwarders and airlines take in order to help the customer um, against that that capacity? And I suppose also is is the choice of active versus passive also now being made based on the current um, the com current sort of global supply chain capacity from an, from an air freight point of view. So um, um, who can start us with you know M M Michael, give us give us an, an idea from a, from an airline you, you've 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 faced some pretty challenging months right so and, and I think hopefully capacity is becoming is becoming more available now. So give us your thoughts in, in relation to what what you see that future looking like. Oh yes. Uh... So, so firstly, uh, I will price my GSA in India. We noted, <laughs> we noted uh, 56 tons on the Dreamliner 789, uh, 56 tons on the Prater. So, so uh, with the cargo on sea, is a full of pharma with a passive system mostly. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, some, somehow I remember also the, the, the active uh, on a normal cargo deck. So 56 tons on a Prater. Uh, so capacity is uh, going. I always say there are, there are four pillars of the, of the airline business, which, which usually are not migrating so much for the ocean freight. One of them is pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals, perishables, e-commerce, and uh, aerospace. All other can migrate very easy for the ocean freight. So these four pillars are also kind of strategy of the airline that I represent as a head of cargo. So uh, normally when you ask me for the pharmaceuticals and, and something uh, and, and stuff like this, or a similar stuff, is a top prior for me. Always, because I feel that it will not leave me later on when the trends have changed, for example, and we come back for the normality. So of course, uh, airlines are looking for the for the uh, for the business coming from the pharmaceuticals and a business for the passive, active, and all this all this stuff, definitely. So uh, from the airline perspective, from my airline perspective, I would say that uh, we are running uh, very much into the segment like this. And uh, before you ask me about the system, about our philosophy, how we do, we also educate a lot of customers. We train them. We train the freight forwarders. We train every day. Also, uh, also our uh, shippers because we are involved in the, the communication. So whatever I do with the projection and the crater operation or uh, advice to my network department to do, some, uh, to do some recovery for our network, first of all, is kind of these four pillars and the pharmaceuticals in, is uh, in the number one. I also mentioned about some politics. Nobody comment. Thank you very much, <laughs> by the way. But uh, you know that uh, the airlines usually, I represent the national carrier. A lot of them, okay, they are not in, maybe in United States, but in Europe, usually countries, they have a nominated national carrier. So their service is not only to do the business for the money, but also to serve uh, a responsible way, uh, some service for the people, for the, for the society. And we feel very responsible way on that. So uh, whatever we do, uh, we cover this kind of business, firstly, from the perspective of the money, because the pharmaceutical pay, uh, this industry pay uh, more money than, than, than all others. And a second, the service for the, for the citizens of our country or the countries that are, are our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for, uh, uh, for example, I direct us. So Perfect. the answer is that whatever is, is going around as uh, the pharmaceuticals, uh, they are on the first stage, on the first step, and definitely uh, our focus stays on that. Thank you. Excellent. Mike Meekin, can I just get your opinion from a freight forwarder's perspective in, in regards, has capacity over the last 18, 24 months influenced your choice in regards active or, or a passive system? Um, I think it's probably been driven by other factors and it's not just being capacity. I mean, one of the things that did happen, if we sort of go back, maybe in a bit of history over the past 18 months, two years, uh, there were a number of other factors going on that we may have forgotten, like uh, 
when China, and especially around Wuhan, had its issue, and there were other things going on, um, I recall there were a lot of containers, different sort of like active units, either stuck in China that couldn't get out, or vice versa, We because of uh, lockdowns. And we did find, if I turn the clock back to probably 15 months ago, there were challenges that if you wanted to use a particular type of package or container, you had a problem. So that might have given people, okay, we'll, we'll switch this way. I think everything else that we've discussed comes into play because okay. uh, within the logistics world, okay, we ideally we want to go direct is what everybody said, but it's um, I'd refer to like one of our in-house uh, quality risk tools. You can put in there, I need to go from uh, Sao Paulo and I've got to go to Shanghai and I've got to move certain particular products. And we can put in anything in there. You know, we can say, well, if you want to do it with thermal blankets, it comes out with a particular type of risk. If I want to do it with these airlines, and uh, as we use the tool, we put in the different pack pack packaging, whether it's passive or active and the different types, whether we're using things like thermal blankets or what types of road transport we're using. And all of a sudden you get routes and you think that would be no problem. But from local experience, because we need to go through a particular airport, all of a sudden the thing comes red. You know, and it's quite an interesting thing because you start a building all of these variables. So coming straight back to your question, what do you, do you see? I think uh, because a lot of the packaging is done at the manufacturer's end, it's what we handle and receive. If they're putting it into an active container, we will handle and ship. And it also depend right at the beginning, I mentioned our different logistic solutions. So we are an integrator. So we've got an integrator business, which handles smaller, less than a pallet size, uh, thermal packaged, you know, passive package, and we'll ship it direct to vaccination centers all around the world. So it's almost door to door. Then we'll handle the large air freight or ocean freight um, in some cases uh, with, uh, with products. And then we've got what we do in the countries with, um, you know, the last mile type. So I think a lot of that's driven by what you're given uh, and what you handle. So, but the big one, right at the start of this was there was a lot of equipment uh, which was in the wrong place at times and then if you needed to use that that became a challenge um, but the good thing I think with passive and I'll re restate that again is it is simple to use um, and if you do get things like power failures and things like that if you've got a solution and a pack out that you want to last for a month sorry a week then you know it will last that, you know, and it's a robust solution. If you've got stuff which is very time critical, again, you could still use a passive, but you might then, there might be other factors which drive it. Thanks, Mike. Um, unfortunately, time is against us. We've, uh, we've come to the end of the uh, end of the session. So I think we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up, certainly for for today's discussion. So obviously I need to thank uh, each of you for joining us today uh, in regards to our, our, our round table conversation. Uh, it's been uh, incredibly enjoyable uh, and even from my perspective, immensely interesting from a learning point of view to be part of the discussion. So thanks to each one of you for being so open and, and sharing with us your thoughts and your experiences within the industry. And um, I definitely like to thank everyone that attended the session. And I, my sincerest apologies if there were any questions that we haven't answered. Um, but with that in mind, there will be a video of this uh, webinar available really, really shortly. Um, and that will be available uh, online to all of you that have registered. Um, there will also be a white paper on this particular discussion, um, very much uh, in regards to the discussions that we've had today with the panelists and other uh, leading figures within the airline, pharmaceutical and uh, logistics and freight forwarding sectors. Uh, that paper is going to be available week beginning the 25th of October. And again, anyone that's registered for today's webinar, uh, you will be notified of that availability. Um, we have to thank Tower uh, Cold Chain for facilitating the session today. Uh, without their um, innovation, without their willingness to 
um, promote um, an impartial discussion, none of us would have had the opportunity to do this today. So thank you all the Tower team for all of your organization and support in respect of today's session. Uh, and then also just watch out for 2022. We're gonna have further sessions similar to this one, further insights into the airline pharmaceutical uh, and logistics markets. Um, so once again, thanks everybody for joining us and thanks so much to uh, everyone for participating. Bye.